I invite you this morning to take a copy of the Bible and open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. That's where we will be this morning. Um, if you're following along in the Pew Bible, we'll be on page 970. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one in one of the pews around you. And uh, if you need one, uh, we encourage you to take that as our gift and bring it with you as we return to worship with us. 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 13. So today we're finishing a series through 2 Corinthians on the gospel-shaped life. And as we've walked through it, we've seen Paul show us and explain the paradox of the Christian life, where there is strength through weakness. And as we finish this letter today, we'll see that while Paul is being specific in what he's teaching about the church and part of how the church should function, it brings us to some application of what our church should look like. We know that the gospel is going to go forward. We know that the kingdom of God is going to go forward and that the church is part of God's plan. It is God's plan for making that happen. God's plan of salvation is not going to be stopped. But there is no guarantee that an individual church will continue in being effective for the Lord. Corinth was in danger of losing its effectiveness if the church continued on the path it was on, of following these false apostles, of walking in unrepentant sin. So what is it that they needed to do in order to change course? Paul has given instructions in both 1 and 2 Corinthians, and we'll see some specific instructions today that he will give them. So if you've got your place in 2 Corinthians 13, I invite you to stand with me as we read our passage this morning. I'm going to read just a portion of our passage this morning just for the sake of time. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. This is the third time I am among you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warn those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you for your word and we thank you for the power of Christ, both that we have experienced in our salvation and God, that we continue to experience as members of your church. Father, we ask that as we look at this text this morning, that you would give us understanding and Father, that you would convict us and comfort us with your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So our main idea of the sermon this morning is that Christ's power is displayed in the church through restoration and fellowship. Christ's power is displayed in the church through restoration and fellowship. So there's three ways that Paul tells us this morning that the church is going to be built up. And the first one is by Christ's power. So first we see that the church is built up by Christ's power. Look again at verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So Paul is referencing the requirement back in Deuteronomy 19 of there being at least two or three witnesses to bring a charge against someone. So he's giving direction and explanation on how he's going to operate as it pertains to discipline. If you remember last week at the end of chapter 12, he was talking about the possibility of having to practice church discipline when he returned. So he's continuing in his explanation there, here at the beginning of chapter 13. Verse 2, I warned those who sinned before and all the others. I warned them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me. So we saw some description of his second visit to Corinth earlier in 2 Corinthians, and he warned them what would happen if they did not repent of the sin that was ongoing. If they don't repent, Paul is going to discipline them when he returns. Now, why does he do this? Why does he warn them of discipline? Does he get some kind of satisfaction out of watching them squirm? Remember last week, one of the reasons was because of the affection. It's not because he wants to make them uncomfortable. 
not just for that sake. He loves them and wants to see them repent. But he also gives them another reason back in verse 3. Remember, they have challenged the fact that Paul is an authentic apostle. They've doubted that. And Paul's dealt with that a couple of times here in 2 Corinthians. He says, fine, if you want to see that I'm an apostle and you want proof that I speak with the authority of Christ, then I will give you proof, but you're not going to like it. He says, I'm coming with the authority that Christ has given me to discipline you. Part of his authority of an apostle was the authority to discipline them as a church. Look at back at verse 3. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. What well, Christ in his incarnation, which we will celebrate here in a little over a month, of his becoming fully human while being fully God... He, that was him taking on weakness. And in that weakness, he died on the cross, but then rose again from the dead in the power of God. He died to pay for our sin, but rose to seal our salvation. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive with us in the church today. Because as Paul is teaching, Christ is in us. Therefore, Christ's power is in us. And Christ's power has built us to be a building of living stones, Peter said in 1 Peter. And Paul has written about this, about how, Paul's, how Jesus' power is revealed in our weakness. Back in verse 4, For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Christ's discipline through Paul will not be weak. Christ is not going to take the sins of Corinth lightly, nor will he take our sin lightly. Power, Christ's power is not just observed in forming the church. Christ's power is observed and it builds up the church through discipline. The power that Christ has given Paul includes, as we've said, the, the ability and the authority to discipline them because of their unrepentant sin. It means that they are walking in perpetual sin and continuing in this sin. And Corinth, as we saw, has seen the power of God in miracles and signs and wonders. And maybe they even turned to the gospel as a result. But now they're getting ready to experience Christ's power and discipline in a different way. It manifests, manifests itself in a different way, but it's still going to build up the church. But as they experience God's power in discipline, we need to understand what that looks like. When we hear that, we automatically think that that's going to be punitive. And it may be. But we have to remember that God's power through Christ and how it's used is revealed in the gospel. Romans 1.16 tells us, what the power of God is for. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's power, whether it's in discipline or to salvation, is redemptive. God's power is what raised Christ from the dead and what takes us and removes us from the trash heap of our sin to be a new creature, a new creation moving us toward res the restoration of being the image bearer of what we were supposed to be. The process of repentance then, through discipline, through Christ's power, is still the work of the gospel. The process of repentance after we are saved is still the work of God. It is still Christ's power. It's how we can repent of our sins, turn away from sin, and commit to Christ and run to him for forgiveness even after we are saved. That's how Paul can say in Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those in Christ. Because even after we sin, after we have been saved, we have forgiveness in Christ when we repent. So experiencing the power of Christ, even in discipline, is a good thing. Although in the moment, if it is punitive, it won't feel good. That's what the writer of Hebrews says when he says, discipline, even for a moment, is unpleasant. But what it brings with it is the fruit of righteousness and holiness. 
This past week, we celebrated Veterans Day where we acknowledged and celebrated those among us who have served in our armed forces and sacrificed. And I think if and there's many in our church who are veterans, and I think if we were to ask them, they would probably share stories of the discipline that they endured while they were in the military. They would all remember the different types of punishment and training that they had to endure in order to make sure that they did the right things as a member of their platoon or a member of their unit. The reason they had to endure that is because they had to be ready for any situation. If someone got out of line, they needed to learn the importance of being in line and following the rules before they were in combat and before they were in situations that were very dangerous. If they did something that was not in keeping with, with the conduct or good conduct of a soldier, it could put the whole unit in danger. And the church operates in similar fashion. If someone, a member of our church, is walking in unrepentant sin, that is a danger to the church. Christ has built his church through the gospel, made up of saved people who have put their faith in Christ, people who have experienced his power and salvation. But if we are followers of Christ and we are involved in unrepentant sin, he is going to use his redemptive power to discipline us, to protect us, and to protect his church. If, an unre if unrepentant sin is allowed to continue in a church, the church will become ineffective. Christ tells us in, if, in, Re in Revelation 2, he warns the church at Ephesus, if you do not repent, I will remove my lampstand. In other words, I will take my power away. And that should chill us as a body of believers, that if we allow that to go on, Christ will remove his power. Christ loves us too much and paid us too, what, too, paid too big of a price to allow us to walk in unrepentant sin. So Paul, with the power of Christ, is going to discipline Corinth. And if they don't, but it will be for their good, to build them up, to make them stronger. And this discipline, which will lead to repentance, then leads to restoration, which Paul is going to talk about next. Next, we see that the church is built up by restoration. Look at verse 5, of, back to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. So what will lead to repentance and restoration? We've talked about discipline, but also Paul says it's self-examination. Looking at ourselves, having a moment of introspection to make sure we are indeed in Christ. In other words, to make sure that we are indeed of the faith, that we are saved so why does Paul tell them to test themselves? It's because the behavior that Corinth has been showing is not the behavior that we would expect to see of one who is a Christian. They were not giving or showing the fruit of someone who was a follower of Christ. So he's saying, test yourself to see if you're holding to the truth of the gospel. That's what he explains later in verse 8. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Because in other words, if you are a follower of Christ, you can't do anything but hold to the truth. And if for a season we're not holding to the truth, we will eventually, God will eventually discipline us so that we repent. And so he's saying, test yourself to see if you are of the truth, that you are of the faith. A follower of Christ is dead to sin. It doesn't mean we won't sin, but it means that our lives are not characterized by sin. Why? Because of our union with Christ, Paul says. Christ is in you, Christian, and if he is in you, then you will pass the test. If Christ is in you, then you are of the faith. So that begs the question, how do we know that Christ is in us? Well, the first thing we need to test is whether or not we believe and follow Christ. That's where it's got to begin. Do you believe the truth of the gospel? But then the New Testament also gives us additional ways. He writes to the church at Galatia in Galatians 6. 
He says to test your actions. In other words, look at your conduct. Look at your behavior. Is your behavior and conduct consistent with how a Christian is supposed to live? Consistent with the commands of Scripture? For specifically for Corinth, Paul had given them instructions. He told them to flee sexual immorality. So Corinth, are you fleeing immorality? He told them not to worship idols. So Corinth, are you not worshiping idols? We look to these moral commands in Scripture, not to see if our good outweighs the bad so that God might approve of us, but are our actions consistent with the profession of faith we have? Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter speaks to this. Peter speaks to these evidences and he speaks to the topic of testing our salvation to see if we are of the faith. 2 Peter 1 verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Now he says, supplement your faith. That means that these will be evidences of your faith. These aren't things that will, so, that will save you. Supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For these qualities are yours and are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what's Peter saying in this text? He's saying that these actions, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, knowledge of Christ, these are symptoms of our salvation. They indicate that we have been saved. They don't save us. But it's the fruit and the overflow of the change that God has brought about. So ultimately, our ongoing sanctification is going to be proof that Christ is in us. Are we more like Christ today than we were previously? Yesterday, last week, last year, last month, we will have setbacks in sin. And there will be seasons of our lives when we will battle sin more than others. But is the long-term trajectory that of one who is going in Christ? And I don't think, though, because as we hear this, we sense the gravity of what Paul is saying. But I don't think that Paul calls for this to be something that we live in ongoing doubt. We should periodically take stock of where we are in our spiritual growth and test ourselves because there is an exam that's coming when we will stand before God and that is the exam we have to pass. And it is a zero-sum game. And the way we pass it is through whether or not we have put our faith in Christ. But I don't think that Paul wants us to live in a state of doubt. I don't think that's what he wants and what he's telling Corinth. We don't need to get up day after day wondering whether or not we're saved. But we do need to periodically check, take stock of our growth. We take our sin seriously and we work to mortify it, to put it to death. But we also need to take the grace and mercy of God seriously and rest with confidence in the finished work of Christ. When we read 2 Corinthians 13, we need to see that Paul does not expect them to fail. Paul is confident that they will pass the test. He's not trying to trick them, and he's not trying to trick us. 1 John is another book that we can look at that tells us the ways we can be confident. When John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants us to have confidence that we have eternal life. And the way we do that is by looking at our growth, putting our faith in Christ. Let's return back to 2 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 6. I hope that you will find out that we have not failed the test. So what's he mean here? 
He's saying that when they say, when Corinth, when you pass the test, in other words, when you realize that you are of the faith, then hopefully you will see and that will prove to you that we are of the faith as well. In other words, that I am an authentic apostle. That your faith in Christ proves that I am an apostle. But that's not his main priority. Look at verse 7. But we pray to God that you may do no wrong, that we may appear, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. Proving to Corinth that he is an apostle is not his main priority or purpose. His main priority for Paul, or his main priority, is that Corinth would be restored and would walk with the Lord. If it seems to Corinth that Paul has failed to prove that he is an apostle, yet they continue to walk in truth, that they continue to be restored, then so be it. If Paul is made weak so that Corinth is strong in the Lord, so be it. If they are restored and the church is strengthened, that's what Paul is praying for. And that is where the work of restoration begins, with prayer. So friends, if there is a person or in our church or in your life that needs to repent of sin and needs to be restored, we start by praying for that person. Matthew 18 has given us the, the way that we walk through restoration, but it has to be a work of God. And that begins with prayer. Now, some of you may watch home improvement shows or maybe you've been through the process of restoring a home. Now, almost always they go into these old homes and they, or maybe even not if it's an old home or homes with serious problems. And you know, there's always the, the big issue that, all right, this is gonna cost a million dollars for us to fix, but we gotta do it anyway. You, you know, if you, if you watch those shows, you know what I'm talking about. But let's say you go into the basement and you see that there's a huge problem. There's cracks in the foundation. Or maybe there's a, a load-bearing wall and there's cracks in it. I don't know if that's a thing, but on these shows, it is. So I'm just going to act like it is. If it's not, somebody can correct me later. But if there is a serious problem, how do they go about fixing it? They don't stand at the cracks and yell at it and say, how, what kind of a house are you? You've got cracks in the foundation. You stupid house, how could you do that? They don't begin by taking a hammer or a sledgehammer and just beginning to wail on the foundation. Those things are not going to be helpful in restoring it. Now, they take drastic action because it can't be left alone. But they, with love and with care, go in to repair and to restore. That's how it is with each other. If there is someone who needs to be restored, then that begins with prayer and drastic action. And sometimes it will be drastic, but it also means we approach it with love and with care. We don't bludgeon someone. Verse 10, For this reason I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come I may not have to be severe in my own use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Remember what they had accused Paul of being? Strong in writing, yet weak in person. He tells them again, that's not the way he wants to be when he comes. He does not want to be severe. He wants to come in mercy, wants to come in the meekness of Christ. That's what he wrote earlier. He does not want to tear them down. The word he uses there means to dismantle, to take them apart piece by piece. He says, that's not what I want to do. I want to build you up. That's what my authority is for. But he's willing to do that if he has to. His authority is to build up the church. Restoration of a wayward member strengthens the church. It's not going to weaken it. Just as we restore the foundation of a home, it makes that home stronger. When we restore a wayward member, it makes a church stronger. It puts the gospel on display. It proves that we believe what the gospel says. It shows that we believe the grace of God can and will change a person's life. When we begin the process of restoration, that means we, be we believe that the gospel will change this person, that they will remember the faith that they have and they will repent and be restored. So our desire cannot be revenge or delight in seeing a brother or sister be punished. We should grieve their sin as Paul grieved the sins of Corinth and pray for our church to be strengthened 
through the restoration of brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, we see that the church is built up through godly fellowship. The church is built up through godly fellowship in chapter 13. Look with me in verse 11, chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. So Paul's given them things that should characterize how we relate and how we should fellowship with each other. We've already seen his desire and encouragement to be restored. But there's also the encouragement to comfort each other. Paul has used the word comfort a lot in 2 Corinthians. Paul knew that they were, they were being afflicted. That they were suffering. He was confident in that. And there is, we can be confident there's affliction taking place among us even today in different ways. Whether it's our health or family or job. And we need to be quick to comfort each other in affliction, comforting with Scripture, comforting with the promises of God. Now, Paul's instruction to agree with each other doesn't mean that we need to agree with each other on everything all the time. It means to be of the same mind or to be like-minded. It means that we need to be on the same page for all of the main things and all of our priorities. Do we all agree on what our mission is as God's church? That's where we need to agree. That's where we need to be of the same mind. Are we of the same mind that we are called to make disciples through the ministry of this local church? That's what Paul's talking about. We need to live in peace with each other. When we disagree, we talk about it. We don't allow anger to fester. And it takes commitment for this type of fellowship. Commitment to each other as church members to be in each other's lives. Not in invasive ways, but in ways where we have the comfort to share what we're battling. To share and confess our sins to each other. This type of fellowship builds trust so that when repentance and restoration is needed, we can have relationships that enables us to have those conversations with each other. And he says, and the love of God of love and peace will be with you. And when he says that, he's not saying that's a reward that God will be with us. That if you do all of those things, God will be with you. What he's saying is, be encouraged. As you aim for restoration, as you aim to comfort each other, as you aim to be of the same mind, you have the God of peace who is right there with you. God is among us. God is with us. Verse 12, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Now, while I wouldn't encourage us to do that, the point is that we need to have a brotherly and sisterly fellowship with each other, and we express that. Let's not forget that while we are here at this location, too, that we are part of a larger global church, all the saints greet you. So all the saints from the other churches that he's mentioned in Macedonia and all these other places, they greet you. So there are churches around us that are doing gospel work. There are churches all over the world that are doing gospel work. We need to be aware of them. And then verse 14, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He has what he's given us here, a benediction. As I've said before, that means a good word. Bene, meaning good, which is where we get the word benefit from, which means it does someone good. And diction, which means word. If you ever, if you, um, if you ever have taken classes in public speaking, uh, they talk about using proper diction, speaking clearly. So we call that a benediction. That's where that word comes from. And you may notice that we often finish our worship services with these benedictions from Scripture. So as Paul leaves his letters with that, we often want to leave each other with this good word as we go back out into the world. And we need to see here how Paul does this. He finishes and gives a benediction that names all three members of the Trinity. Now, I don't have time to get into all the implications of that, but I think there's application that we draw there, specifically for our fellowship. God himself, by his nature, is in fellowship. That all three members of the Trinity are in fellowship with each other. 
fulfilling their different jobs in fellowship and in satisfaction with each other in perfect harmony. And we need to imitate that and imitate God in how we fellowship. So as we are unified with Christ and have fellowship with Christ, that should affect how we fellowship with each other. The sweeter our fellowship is with Christ, the sweeter our fellowship will be with each other. So that our fellowship with each other is an overflow of our fellowship with God. It means that at our gathering and our interactions with each other should be different than how we interact with the world. It should spur us on to good deeds. When we finish being with each other, we should be encouraged and refreshed to go on and do good deeds. It should encourage each other in holiness. Our fellowship should sanctify us, in other words. So it goes back to when we examine ourselves. It's one of the reasons we join a church, to hold us accountable So how does this take place? We see it in Ephesians 4.29 where he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Our fellowship is a means of experiencing God's grace. It doesn't save us, but it sustains us. We should look forward to being in fellowship with each other because this world's going to beat us up. And we come to each other for comfort and in fellowship. We are refreshed. It gives us grace. When we're with each other, we should feel God's favor. We should feel God's riches. So let's not neglect it. Let fellowship be both our duty and our joy. So how should we then live? We ask ourselves, do we desire restoration and fellowship at Seven Oaks? Do we desire restoration and fellowship at Seven Oaks? I was talking with one of our members this week about the sermon, and he asked a great question that I had not considered, both as we've preached through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And he asked this question. He said, are there things to commend from Corinth? Another thing, other words, are there good things in Corinth that we should see and that we should apply? We think about all the things that Corinth got wrong. We see all the things that they were doing poorly, and of course, we need to avoid those things. But what were they doing well? Well, one of the things that we are shown is that they were doing the Lord's Supper incorrectly and that they were being disruptive in their worship services. We saw that back in 1 Corinthians. They were using their gifts in a way that was disruptive. They were also, in 2 Corinthians, being led astray by false teachers. But in those, what do we see that they were doing right? One, they were gathering for fellowship. They were doing it wrong, but they were prioritizing gathering. They at least saw the priority of gathering for worship and for fellowship. It's hard for us to fellowship with each other if we're not together and if we're not here. We must make public meetings a priority. They also wanted to use their gifts, even though they were using them incorrectly. We must desire to use the gifts that God has given us. And we can help each other in discerning those gifts. And help each other in helping others to see where God might be using them in the body of Christ. They were arrogant in how smart they were. They were arrogant in their learning. But that means that they desired to learn the things of God. We might not all be the best students, but it's clear that we must know about God in order to grow as his disciples. And Paul has discussed discipline and repentance in both letters and restoration. So it's encouraging when we see later in his letters that Corinth did in fact repent and was restored. So these things that they were doing incorrectly, we are led to believe they turned around. Romans 15, 24 says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome, and he's explaining what happened. He says, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the servants. Or saints, rather, from Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution to the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. Remember, Achaia is the region where Corinth is. 
And we typically understand that Paul is writing the letter to Rome from Corinth. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. So he says it wasn't just that they gave to the collection. He says, for they were pleased to do it. So we take from that, if Corinth was pleased to give to the collection, then we have evidence that they repented and that they were walking in restoration, doing all the things that Paul called them to do. Corinth repented of whatever was was going on, gave to the collection. If we confront others, it must be with the hope and desire to see them restored. And if we are confronted in sin, that we need to be quick to repent and ask forgiveness and quick to offer it when repentance comes. All of this is enabled by the power of Christ. The church is God's and we have our allegiance to him. Friends, the church is nothing without Christ's power. He both builds it and sustains it in it. And that's manifest both as we test ourselves and restore ourselves, but also as we have fellowship together. Let's pray. God, we do give you praise and thanks, Father, for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that we don't have to rely on our own intellect, that we don't have to rely on our own power, that we don't have to rely on our own means, Lord God, that through your power you will build your church. And Father, we confess that we are an imperfect people. Lord, we know that we will sin against you and we will sin against each other. But God, we thank you for the gift of repentance and restoration. And we pray that we would be quick to offer that toward each other. Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow in our understanding of what that looks like, to grow in our understanding and our dependence on your Son. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.